Hello, my friends. I mean you. Yes, you. Data of every description will pervade our consciousness. Holograms projected beneath our eyelids. Welcome to the DCC Museum. Welcome to the DCC Museum. Here's a new intro for you. Jacques Houtsmit is visiting today. He's living close, so today he's helping us to tear down, a little bit unrespectful, but it's really a tear down of the DCC playback unit that we recently obtained in the Netherlands. It was used and, uh, as a mastering device to test mastering tapes. We're missing other pieces of the electronics to fully make this functional, as this is not a standalone player. But we're excited to share with you what we did find while we were actually dissecting this player. All right, here it is. It's very heavy. It, uh, we just weighed it. It weighs about 13 pounds. Let's just turn it around and see how to take it apart. It's very sturdy. So I may, it may look like I'm throwing it around, but um, it's, it's, this thing is not gonna break. Right, this looks pretty interesting. It looks like the head is directly connected to all these transistors and other parts. So this is a playback only machine and it has 18 heads which means uh, it looks like the head is not uh, does not flip over it, it doesn't rotate like in uh, consumer machines and the reason it's so heavy is that this frame it looks like that's this is steel it's very thick there's a date on here 24th of November 93 See a date code here, 9241. So that's week 41 of Looks like the head does not rotate at all. So it has a special head, like a portable head, and not a uh, pivoting mechanism like the consumer recorders have.
you can see this, this, this here is the board that has all the buttons on the front side and it's connected to this board back here so that must be the control board there's another unused connector here that looks identical to the connector that goes to the front side so I'm thinking maybe this board was um, used for other purposes too maybe for a professional recorder, professional player of in, in other use cases the eject button doesn't uh, unlatch we'll see if we can fix that in some way it looks like it's, it might be a little out of place or something the ICs here these this this one this one this one and this one are all um, P uh, 74 HCT 4051 um, I just looked those up and those are uh, 8 to 1 analog switches so I'm not sure what they would be used for but we'll, uh, we'll look a little further Now it's interesting that the um, flat cable that comes from this connector here, which is the control connector, goes straight into the controller board here. And there's no connection, as far as I can see, between the audio panels here and the audio panels here. So it looks like the control portion of this mechanism is completely separated from the audio and data section, which is interesting. Now, unfortunately, this, uh, it looks like a nylon assembly. It's connected straight to the front panel and this is where the um, the flex cable of the heads goes through and uh, I'm a little worried about taking that off so I don't think we'll take this further apart much further than this because I'm a little worried that we might tear that and damage something that cannot be repaired Okay, let's see if we can get a little further in here by taking the control board off. By the way, I see a microcontroller here that has a date code of 15th of October 1903, which is much later than the other date codes on this machine. All the other date codes are all 1992, and this has a 1993 date code. And that means that it might have been in use for a while and then they decided to make some improvements to the software or firmware and replace the chip and then put it back to use. There are three connectors here that goes from the control board to the mechanism. Let's take those out. Okay. 
this control this board which is on the on the mechanism is made by a different factory looks like it has a date code of 9207 so it's much older than the rest of the electronics It looks like there are some um, switches and contacts and um, coils on there, so I don't think I'll take this further apart. Let's see if we can find out more about this audio board. So this is interesting because this is the it says here read amplifier and so far in all the commercial recorders that we've seen we've only seen read amplifiers integrated into a chip so this is actually the de-chipped version of the read amplifiers interesting now I can't take this further apart because these two boards are soldered together but it looks like these are either symmetrical or identical and these must be the nine read amplifiers for one side for the A side say and these are the read amplifiers for the B side and it looks like that's really all it does now on a regular DCC player or DCC recorder uh, all the signals from the read amplifier would be multiplexed so that uh, one of each uh, one head is sent to the next uh, integrated circuit at a time so first it's track 0, track 1, track 3, track 2, track 3 etc these look like they're all sent at the same time. The next step in the where the signal goes in the signal path is this board and it has the 8 to 1 uh, integrated circuits. So what I'm thinking is that this entire electronic system except for the control board of course replaces the uh, one of the read amplifiers uh, that you would find as an integrated circuit in a normal commercial recorder and that what comes out of this connector uh, basically could go into a DCC uh, player at the point where normally 
all the um, heads are multiplexed and uh, amplified. So that's pretty much it. All right, let's see if we can um, remove a part of the mechanism here to uh, see if we can fix the eject button. The eject button is kind of stuck. It, uh, once it opens, it doesn't want to unlatch anymore. Um, I think that's just a mechanical problem, maybe something with lubrication or something. So uh, we don't want to remove this part because, um, like I said, the, the head is attached to the front and the mechanism is attached to the front and the head has a, a flex cable that's probably really sensitive and uh, we don't really mess with it. Um, so we're going to just remove this side of the bracket and not the other side so everything stays in place except for the eject button mechanism It looks like the friction is coming from here. This little plate shifts over the other plate that's underneath. And I think if we put a little molly coat or something like that underneath, we can probably make this eject mechanism work as if it was new. Now this plunger is intended so that it doesn't just spring open, it dampens it. Yeah, that's, that's definitely where the friction is, is right there. So I'm going to see if I can free that up without taking it all apart and having to redo all the springs. So it looks like the eject button just got displaced a little bit. And let's see if we can unscrew it a little to um, see if we can make that eject mechanism work better. So there's a lot of play in the mechanism around the eject button. So if I center that and then tighten the screw, that might make a bit of difference. like that might have done the trick so what do you uh, what do you think uh, Jack in, in in conclusion about about this board which I think is the, the 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 biggest discovery that it isn't fully integrated yeah the interesting discovery here is that we have a, a sort of a solid state version uh, almost of uh, what in a 
consumer recorder or production recorder is all in one integrated circuit. And that is here, this, this is the head amplifiers for the nine heads in combination with some input circuitry. And um, it, of course this is doubled. So um, this would make it possible for us, in theory, to uh, remake a part of um, a DCC recorder or DCC player uh, in solid state form and duplicate it when uh, those chips that are in production DCC recorders are not available anymore. So this is an important part of uh, how the analog electronics works and uh, we're we don't have to reverse engineer the entire analog electronics of this just yet, but we know that this board exists and that we can refer to this as a, a possibly a means of um, making our own chips one day maybe, or making a replacement once those chips are not available anymore. So given the fact that this is built uh, with signature on um, late 93 and uh, November 24th, 1993, would you consider it then possibly to be done so that it could replace the board easily as a service friendliness for this professional playback unit? Yeah, I think uh, for a professional unit, um, it would probably be uh, beneficial uh, for a, a studio, a professional environment that uh, they can go in and replace small parts themselves. So these are all basically standard parts. Um, you know, it, it's probably not that easy to do your own uh, soldering and um, uh, your own servicing. But for a professional um, facility uh, like a broadcasting station or something like that, or a, a record studio, uh, it would certainly be possible to have, that they would have the tools to replace a single capacitor or a single uh, uh, a, a single small SMB transistor and uh, they would probably f think that would be more interesting and more um, beneficial to them than replacing an entire IC. Okay, we're gonna put uh, we're gonna put this all back together and uh, of course we might not be able to get it uh, working because this is just part of the puzzle on the entire mastering equipment that uh, studios would use. This is the playback unit that doesn't really have a power on button. We will see what we can do with that in the future, but until then, thanks for watching. See you next time. Thanks, thanks for Jack. watching. Bye bye.